human limb, what we know as a leg or as an arm, they have a specific polarity. What do I mean by polarity? Uh, the arm always have the fingers at the distal end, right? And a leg always has toes in that same distal end. Fingers never end up on, on the elbow or the toes never emerge from the kneecap, for instance, right? So, and although it is clear that fingers and toes and arms and leg are different, uh, they have the common morphological pattern. Come on. on the other window, I need to come back to this window. Okay. So this is the figure that we have in, in the book, and we see that the bones of uh, any vertebral limb, whether it's a leg or an arm or a flipper or a wing, is always consistent of three different parts as we uh, as we see here. So the stylopode is the proximal end of the limb. The middle part is called the zygopod. In this case, we are talking about the ulna and the radius because we are in the arm. And the distal part is the autopod. We have the carpals and digits, independently of which of these parts are. So stylopole will be the humerus or the femur, depending on which part we talk, okay? And is the proximal, so the most close to uh, the body. So under these three parts, we see that whether there is an arm or a wind or a leg on a horse, they all have the same three parts. So, and it all comes from the lean field, either the anterior, as we see here, we have a little bit of the plate, lateral plate mesoderm, as we have seen that it contributes to the creation of the limb. And then we have here in the posterior portion, and this is something that you're gonna be looking into next lab, okay? How this plate helps to the creation of these limb fields. They also have um, a little bit of axis formation. So we have the posterior will be always towards the pinky and the anterior is always the thumb or the more interior of the body. And we also have a dorsal ventral part on top of this proximal distal axis. So they are not easy. They are kind of a little bit of a complex in, in, in that order. Okay, and as we see here, it all starts with this section on the dorsal side, the ventral, posterior, and anterior, and we have here the air. Okay, this is what it would be generating that uh, field. So when we talk about the limb, we need to talk about the pattern of formation. So the pattern formation is a process by which Embryonic cells form an orderly spatial arrangement of different tissues. It's not the same to form a pinky than to form a thumb, okay? So this ability of the limb cells to sense the relative position, because even though we are in the distal portion towards the hand, we still need to know where is the pinky and where is the, the, the thumb, right? So this relative position will determine what type of tissue they will become, okay? And it has a lot of experimentation that has been going on in order to find what is what to differentiate those specific tissues depending on their position. So for instance, how the osteoblasts in the upper arm know to form the humerus and those at the distal part from the digits. So there is a little bit of timing that's gonna come in to get these uh, specific tissues to form the specific uh, organ. So the cells are the same because we have nerves, muscles, and bones from the beginning to the end. 
they are exactly the same elements, but the patterns they form are different, right? So vertebrae limbs is a complex organ with asymmetrical arrangements of the parts. And the three major axes, as I mentioned them a couple of seconds ago in the previous slide, is the proximal distal. So most of the time it's going to say the POD, the anterior posterior, and the dorsal ventral. Okay. So the thumbs is anterior, the pinky is posterior, and the knuckles is dorsal, and the palm is ventral. Okay. So in some manner, this 3D pattern of the limb is produced uh, again and again without, well, sometimes with some uh, variations, as we're going to see. But basic morphometric rules uh, for forming a limb appear to be the same in all tetrapods. So the positional information needed to construct a limb, it will, comes uh, <coughs> for each of the axes that we have. So uh, proximal distance is shoulder, shoulder, excuse me, my tongue, shoulder to finger or hip to toe. Okay, the anterior posterior is the thumb to pinky, and then the dorsal ventral palm to knuckles. So the specification of the limb feel, which is what we have right here, that's the limb feel, seems to be controlled by Hox genes and retinoic acid. Okay, so all of the cells in the area of the embryo capable of forming a limb is what we constitute the fill limb. And we see here different colors, and these colors are important to have this dorsal ventral uh, axis to start with, and then we want to see the rest as, as we progress. So when this fill forms, the limb fill has the ability to regulate for lost or added parts and we want to see some experimentation that has been made. So, for example, in the tail bud stage uh, of the salamander, which is what we have in here, half of the limb field is able to generate an entire limb when grafted to a new site. So, even if we take part of this and we put it into a new host, they are capable of generating a complete field. So let's look at a little bit of uh, how this field are defined and how the cells migrate into it. So the cells making the limb bud are derived from the posterior lateral plate mesoderm. So here we have a little bit of what we have seen before. So this is our lateral plate, and we saw how a lot of these cells get to the um, tissue to mesenchymal transition to go and invade new sections in the body, okay? So these are the ones that are going uh, closest to the somite and covered by the ectoderm, as we see in here. So this is the ectoderm, this is the apoxial uh, myotome, and this is the hypoxial, so the farthest from the neural tube, as we have seen, and see here how this cell are coming from this lateral plate and mesoderm and some from that section too. So they are migrating and populating the limb bud. That is what we have in here. So this mesenchymal cells migration indicated by these arrows are in proliferation. So they are getting up, going to that transition Okay, so and mainly from this lateral plate and mesoderm and invade the limb section over here. So the mesenchymal cells migration from the somite is established, uh, is what established the muscle, the limb muscle precursors. So this is the lateral plate mesoderm and some are coming from the somite. Okay, so this is the two sources of mesenchymal cells that will form that uh, limb bud. So the limb bud also is uh, 
organize into three functional distinct domains that are the ones that we have here in the screen. The progress zone that we call the PZ is a highly proliferative uh, mesenchymal zone that fuels the limb growth. So it's what allows all these cells to continue growing and growing, 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 growing this way to the, the distals, okay? And that progress zone is an undifferentiated zone. So cells in that zone do not differentiate yet. Just the only thing that they need to do is to divide by mitosis and generate a great amount of the different cells that are going to constitute the, the limb. The second zone is the zone of polarizing activity. As we see here, is localized in the posterior proximal zone of the limb bud, okay? So this is the limb bud, this is the posterior, this is the anterior, and proximal because it's closest to the body, okay? Cells in this zone within the most posterior region of the cell establish that anterior-posterior axis, okay? So every cell that passes through this are knowing that they belong to that posterior part of the limb. And then the most important one uh, so far, well, all of them are important, but without the next one, this is the apical ectodermal ridge. There is no limb that can grow, okay? So this is a thickening, as we see in here, of the ectoderm, actually, okay? And it's at the apex of the limb bud. And from here, this is what will allow also this uh, polarity and progress of the limb. So these results play an important role in the limb development as well in the polarity of the limb. So in all vertebrates, there are four limb buds per embryo, okay, which are always opposite to each other with respect to the midline of the embryo. So we have the arms left and right, or the wings left and right, and then we have the legs also left and right. They are always positioned in parallel and perpendicular to one another. So the limb of different vertebrate animals are different with respect to the somite level, and we have seen that before, and remember that that's the level where the hox, different hox genes are expressed, right? So, however, their position is constant with respect to the level of hox gene expression along this anterior-posterior axis. For example, we have in, um, in fish, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals, the four limb buds are found at the most anterior expression of the hox C6, okay? That is more or less at the level of the first thoracic vertebra. Independently of which animal we are talking, is always positioned at that point where the hox C6 uh, gene is found. Also, the lateral plate uh, mesoderm in the limb field is also important because it induces the myoblast migration uh, out from those somites and enter into the limb bud to become the limb musculature. So no other region of the lateral plate mesoderm will do that, okay? Only where the hocks are expressed. So here we see a little bit of the Hox uh, parallel groups. We have 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. And this is for the four limb with the stylopode, zygopode, and autopode parts. So the first role of Hox genes is to specify where along that anterior posterior axis the limb will form based on the somite position, okay? So Hox determine the where that in that anterior posterior axis, the limb will appear. The second role of Hox genes is to determine 
what structure will be formed in this <coughs> proximal distal axis, either the stylopode, the segopode, or the autopode. So not only where, but what part they need to create. And normally this goes into the five portion parallel nine to 13, okay? So this is the five prime portion where the Hox A and Hox D complexes appear to be active involved into the four limb. At least in mice, that's what we know a little bit more, but that's what happens. So Hox, as we see here, Hox uh, nine and 10 are required for the formation of the stylopode. Okay. Then Hox 11, with a higher concentration expression here, is important for the formation of the zogopode. So the specification of the zogopode is more related to the Hox 11. And then Hox 12 and 13 are paralogues that um, specify the autopode, so the end part of um, the limb. Of course, uh, there are many errors that sometimes happen, okay? And this is what we see here in this figure that is the knocking out of all four well side for the parallels Hoxa 11, and is the Hoxa A11 and the Hoxa D11 that resulted normally on a segopode. So missing. So in here we have the homoblood, then doesn't have the radius and the ulna. So we are missing here the segopode as we go back. So the zogopod is the mid piece over here, and that is what is missing in this image over here. Okay, so A and B. Now, if we um, cause a knocking out of all of the four loci parallax, Hoxa A13 and Hoxa D13, we're gonna result in a mice that is missing the autopod, okay? So we know that the autopod is the terminal end of uh, the uh, limb, okay? So we're gonna have a little bit uh, of abnormalities on the hands and the feet. Um, sometimes we're gonna see the, <coughs> the fingers are fused, as we see in here. And this happens in uh, other animals and in humans, which is the case that we have in here, okay? And uh, so we call this a polysyndactyly. It's a condition where due to the wrong expression or knockout of uh, Hox uh, 13, then the fingers are fused. They are not. And so this is resulting normally from homozygosity uh, for a mutation of the Hox uh, 13. It's quite common sometimes. Sometimes it's just very easy to uh, separate the fingers if we do that uh, early during development. Uh, well, not development, early after birth, okay? So, but we see how, how dramatic change this could be for an individual if not taking care uh, early in life. Uh, the expression of different Hox genes along the anterior posterior. Oops, excuse me. Can I just put somebody in? Okay. I think you went in. Okay. So the expression of different Hox genes along this anterior posterior axis in the trunk sets the pattern of tissue identity. So the initial trigger for the formation of the limb bar can be separated in four steps. And those are the steps that we have here in the screen. So first one is uh, making the mesoderm permissive for limb formation. So we need to go through that mesenchymal transition so they can start populating and get it into uh, the limb. Second is specifying the forelimb or hindlimb 
how do they know that they are at the right level to form the forelimb or the hindlimb? Third, is inducing the epithelium to mesenchymal transition. <coughs> and four, is establishing two positive feedback loops for limb bud formation. So we need two, and this is really important, to maintain and sustain the proliferation of the cells because it's a process that takes a couple of uh, days to get. <coughs> Okay, so the first step was making the mesoderm permissive for information. And this is what we see here. So we have already seen that somatogenesis, that was our last chapter, the gradient between retinoic acid and FGF was fundamental, right? Now, in here, we have FGF8, once again, being part of the expression occurring in the caudal zone of the prismatic mesoderm, okay? So that is in the caudal portion, so in the distal portion. Retinoic acid, on the other hand, was normally generated in the anterior part of the prismatic mesoderm and in the somatic. So Nothing different of what we have said before. Retinoic acid is always in the anterior portion, in this case, because we are talking about the limb bud, we are talking about the proximal portion of the limb bud, and FGF, in particular FGF8, is normally highly expressed in the posterior, which means, in this case, the distal portion of that limb, okay? There are many recent studies, and when I say recent, it's like two years ago, okay, that shows that FGF8 is also expressed within the heart lateral plate mesoderm located just anterior to the frontal limb, which means that we're going to have a double induction, more of the, this FGF8 indicating where to form, because the heart is almost at the same level that the frontal limbs are formed, right? So we'll see a little more in detail <coughs> in a couple of the slides how these two mix, and we see here the expression of different genes, right? Mies, Hox11, and 13, that are following very nicely this gradient of retinoic acid and FGF. Okay, so in here, we know that because retinoic acid as, as a transcription factor, ligand, and has been shown to directly repress FGF8. This is what we see here, retinoic acid repressing FGF in the posterior. Okay, and we saw that during somatogenesis. Remember that? That was a little feedback uh, buckle that we have there. So, and here we see the Hox genes uh, gradient, more in the posterior than the anterior. Okay, so as we see in this image, FGF8 is always limited to the caudal progenitor zone. So this is where we have it in the little image, the, the progress zone. That's where FGF8 normally is located. And retinoic acid is expressed anterior in somites and anterior presomatic mesoderm. Okay, so this is our four limb. Okay, so this is the section where retinoic acid inhibits this FGF8. So the current model for limb bud formation uh, initiation begins with retinoic acid in the limb section, restricting FGF8 coming from the heart and coming from the posterior section. Okay, so it's restricting that expression of FGF where the four limb needs to form. Okay. Uh, now, in the absence of this FGF in this section over here, the lateral plate mesoderm now becomes permissive for the limb bud formation and 
development. So the first thing, the most important one, is to have that FGF expression blocked in that section, and then the lateral plate will become permissive. It seems that FGF8 expression in the anterior and posterior positions help to inhibit the forward limb butt initiation. So that there are many experiments that have been made with this, and we're going to see some in the next slide. Okay. In contrast, retinoic acid uh, is present through the somatic region of the trunk adjacent to the forward limb field, where it exerts an inhibition of this FGF8. So here we have the second part that is how do we do this four limb head limb specification? Okay, so the limb box must be specified as being either anterior or posterior, four limb or head limb. And the gene encoding the transcription factor is TBX. Five, which is responsible for specifying the forelimb, okay? Whereas genes encoding for islet one and TBX4 and PTX1 are expressed in the handling. So it's a little bit more than just this TBX4. So anterior, the TBX5 is enough. For the posterior portion, however, we have islet 1, the TBX4, and PTX1, okay? And all of this, of course, as we see here, is from the lateral plate mesoderm. That is this band of tissue that we see right here, okay? So, with some in-situ hybridization, what we see uh, normally is that during the normal development, and of course the example that we use the most is the chick, the TBX5 in blue is found in the anterior lateral plate and mesoderm, where the TBX4 in red here is found on the posterior lateral plate mesoderm. Limbots containing TBX5 produce wings, so the forelimb, that is what we see in here, okay? And those containing the TBX4 produce the legs, the hind legs, okay? Now, it has been argued that if TBX5, which normally gonna form the forelimb, is lost, in chicks, mice, and fish. This result in a complete failure of the limb formation, okay? So if something happened with the expression of the TBX5, no limb, there is no rescue that can come and make that limb uh, to appear. Nevertheless, the role of the TBX4 and the limb uh, specification seems to vary depending whether there is a mice, a chick, okay? Where in mice, for instance, if the, TG, uh, the TBX4 is lost, uh, it results in a complete failure of the hind limb formation. But in mice, the hind limb is still initiated, but the outgrowth is arrested later. So if we don't have the TVX, it starts, but then it stops. And this, all of this is in mice, okay? But then if a new limb bud is induced with FGF uh, secreting, and this is what we have here, okay? If we add a little bit bead with FGF, the type of limb form depends on which TVX gene is expressed in that limb bud, okay? So now, if we place this bead of FGF between TBX4 and TBX5, yeah, inverse, five and four over here, okay? The bead will induce expression of TBX4 posteriorly and TBX5 anteriorly, and we obtain a chimera. 
leg. So the anterior portion expresses what the tibia five should be, and the posterior portion expresses what the posterior, because it's in between the, the specific uh, somites. Okay. There are some recent studies that have elucidated uh, that the two other factors, the ones that I mentioned, the PTX1 and the islet 1, are required also for the specification of the handle limb. Okay. These experiments have shown that if there is a mixed expression of the T uh, PTX1 in mouse, the forelimb causes its muscles, bone, and tendons to develop into ones that look like the ones in the hand limb, if we put it in the um, forelimb. And then islet one expressed uh, in the hand limb feel before another factor that is going to come, as we're going to see in a couple of the slides, I think it's the next slide, FGF10, because not, it's not only FGF8, FGF10 also. Uh, and then, and this is in mice, the hand limb uh, do not form, which means that we need FGF8 and FGF10, but for that we need also insulate. <clears throat> the third step that we talked about was this transition from epithelial to mesenchymal transition. Let's give me a sec. So uh, prior to uh, the limb bud formation, the lateral plate mesoderm of the somatopleur, so remember this is the somatopleur, that is the ectoderm with this portion of the plate mesoderm in here, both constitute the somatopleur, okay? It's, it's, it's a structure as a pseudo-stratified epithelium, okay? And this is just prior to the limb formation. So the epithelial cells making up the mesoderm of the early somatopleur are the ones that are going to the epithelial mesenchymal transition. I will specifically form the, the lymph field. In the case of the forelimb, the TBX5 seems to be responsible for this transformation passing from epithelial to mesenchymal. Okay, that is in the four limb. So here is the complicated mapping of feedback retroaction. So we have uh, two positive feedbacks that are required for the limb bud formation. Okay, so by an upregulation of the TBX5, that is what we have in here in the middle, and in the four limb, that is this section over here, and islet one, that is what we have in here in the posterior limb field, okay? The mesenchymal cells commit to our limb bud development and start secreting FGF, 10. So it's either TBX5 in the forelimb that makes the cells to start secreting FGF10, and in the posterior limb field is islet 1, the one that secretes the power prime factor FGF10. Is this clear here between the two? Good. Now, FGF10, and as I say in the previous slide, is an important player to initiate the commitment signal for limb formation. If we impede FGF10 to be expressed, those legs don't gonna start growing, they will stop, okay? Also, as we see in here, FGF allows the interaction between ectoderm and mesoderm 
for the limb bone formation and grow. So not only will be implicated into that, but also into the growth. And this is just secreted here by these cells dividing. So mitosis will induce those cells not only to get in contact and start going through that transition, mesenchymal transition, but also to divide and multiply to populate the different sections of the limb. There seems to be a specific Hox proteins uh, by the synthesis of retinoic acid in certain regions of that lateral plate mesoderm that we have in here that is being very active that induces the expression of the particular TBX transcription factors, okay, either the five or the four that are also going to be implicated into the uh, hint information. So, first step. We have here the retinoic acid, particularly in the forelimb, because we know that the concentration of retinoic acid is higher in the anterior portion than in the posterior portion. And here, this is where we have this question mark, because it's not retinoic acid, right? Retinoic acid, we know that is in the anterior portion of the embryo. So in here, we have what it comes from the ectoderm, okay? So <coughs> FGF10 in either fifth limb from the lateral plate mesoderm will induce via WNT beta catenin signaling, okay? So we have, we know that this belongs to the beta catenin family, okay? So, FGF induces the WNT beta catenin signal, and this one will maintain a great concentration of FGF8 on the ectoderm also. So now we have two more sources of FGF8, and FGF8, what happens here is that it will force also the maintenance of FGF10. Okay, so this is the positive feedback that we have, okay? It's a loop between FGF10 and FGF8 to maintain the outgrowth of the limb. What's this part here? Okay, so retinoic acid on the front, induction of B uh, TBX5, and then this cell is also going to generate FGF10. FGF10 will induce the ectoderm to have windless and beta catenin, in this case in the posterior section, and these two then will maintain FGF8 and FGF8. That's the second um, commitment in here. So TBX5 induces also WNT windless 2B in the anterior uh, section, and this one will also upregulate FGF. So it's a it's a it's a double buckle really, as we see here. So if we don't have only one section, FGF maintains here, and then islet islet or BTX5 also with the expression of WNT in the lateral plate mesoderm maintains that FGF10, okay? So that's how it can grow over here, okay? So this step is very important for our next step, that is the formation of the apical ectodermal rich formation, because this is what we wanna allow this ectoderm, right, to grow, outgrow. So FGF10, secreted by the lymph film mesenchyme induces this overlaying ectoderm, as we have seen, to form that apical ectodermal ridge, okay? That is the, ma the major center for the development of the limb. Now, how 
we generate the polarity of the lane because we have three axes, right? Proximal, distal, anterior, posterior, dorsal, ventral. Okay. All of these is made by this apical ectodermal ridge. Okay. So when I talk about this anterior posterior, here we have anterior posterior proximal distal. Okay. So as the mesenchymal cells start entering the lymph field, they secrete copious amounts of FGF10. Okay, because we saw that FGF10 is in that section of the ectoderm, right? So let me see, come back here. So we are in this transition here. So these cells are getting into that section, okay? And <coughs> so they secrete FGF, which induces the overlaying ectoderm that is in this zone to form the apical ectodermal ridge. So as they push towards the growth, the more distal part of that field. This ridge now in red, okay, runs along the distal margin of the limb as we see in here, and it's a major signaling center for the development of the limb. And the main three roles are the ones that we have here in the screen. The first one is maintain the mesenchymal cells beneath in a proliferating phase that allows the linear, meaning proximal to distal growth of the limb. Now, the second role is to maintain the expression of the molecules that generate the anterior-posterior part, which means pinky and thumb axis, okay? And the third is interacting with the proteins specifying the anterior-posterior dorsal-ventral axis so that each cell is given a specific instructions on how to differentiate. So the proximal distal growth and differentiation of the limb bud is made possible by a series of interactions between the limb mesenchyme and the apical ectodermal uh, ridge. And this has been shown through a lot of experimentation. That is what we have here now in the screen. Okay. So here we have the four limb mesenchyme, and this is what we have the apical ectodermal ridge zone over here. So these are the mesenchymal cells that are pushing towards the ectoderm here. And we're gonna go how these experiments happen from one to five. So in here, what we have is if the apical ectodermal bridge here is removed, the development of the limb stops. Okay, so nothing happened. The limb development ceases. Now, if an extra apical ectodermal bridge is grafted, onto its axis, so now we have two of them, okay? Extra structures are formed and are normally, as we see here, the distal parts, the ones that are formed, which are the more distal position, right? So this is what we have here, a wing that is being duplicated. In the third example that we have is if we replace the wind missing kind from a limb but with like mesenchyme, what we obtain is a leg because this mesenchyme knows that what they need to create is a leg. Okay. So the first part is a wing, but the distal part, the autopod, is a leg. In the fourth 
example, what we have is if we replace the limb mesenchyme with no limb mesenchyme, then we have a regression also of the limb. So no limb is formed, right? Because this is not mesenchyme from the limb sections. So this mesenchyme doesn't have the competency to induce that apical ectodermal ridge to form the limb. The fifth example is showing that if the apical ectodermal ridge is replaced by a bead with FGF, remember FGF induces, have the double buckle, right? FGF 10 and FGF 8. And then a normal win is created. So remember that FGF 10 induces the formation of the apical ectodermal ridge. So it comes to a save for this win over here. So although the limb bud mesenchyme induces and sustains the apical ectodermal ridge and determines the limb type and either forelimb or hind limb, the apical ectodermal ridge is also responsible for the sustained growth and development of that limb. So the apical ectodermal uh, ridge keeps the mesenchyme directly beneath it in a state of mitotic proliferation and prevents uh, the formation of cartilage. So it just allows the growth of the leg. Is this image clear into how we can obtain different results, but it's really to show how the apical ectodermal bridge induces this mesenchyme to continue dividing and to form the right structure in the right position and in the right place. Okay, so we have a gradient in all of this, and this is what we see here in this image. So the limb pattern model looks at the opposing gradient between FGF from the distal apical epidermal bridge plus a second gradient of the retinoic acid. So we have FGF in the distal and retinoic acid in the proximal flank tissue, as we can see here. Okay. So the proximal distal axis is generated by opposing gradients of retinoic acid, which we see in blue, okay, from the proximal flank and the FGF on the pink shading over here from the distal ectoderm, apical ectoderma bridge, as we see there. Okay. So we have retinoic acid. Maze, Hox 13, because it's the outer pole section over here, and we maintain a buckle of retroactive induction. Now, what we have here in B is we observe the grafting procedure in a chick embryo when transplanting from <coughs> the limb bud tips is made uh, to the head region. Okay. So depending also at the time, at what stage we place this, okay? So in A over here, okay, results show that retinoic acid uh, proximalizes the bone forming from the transplanted mesenchyme. So this is the untreated and this is the treated one, okay? So we are seeing a, a little bit of a variation. Early in development, this is what uh, we get over here. This is untreated, nothing happened, and treated with retinoic acid, we changed the type of bones and part that they needed uh, to form, okay? Then if we get um, on a stage 21 to 22, we see a little bit of variation also. So untreated limb about tips are here and here we see that it's a little bit of variation, even if it's untreated, right? But it's getting some information differently. And if we do this really late, 
we see that we can induce everything, even in the untreated. So the time at which the, this interaction occurs is important. How much time the cells will spend in the retinoic acid or the FGF section is really important. Okay. So this is showing us this gradient uh, model. <clears throat> so they have here retinoic acid, FGF, right? And proximal distal. Stylopode, the proximal, pseudopode, the mid portion, and autopode, the end portion where Hox 13 is uh, induced. So if we have a treatment with FGFs and WNTs, we change the expression pattern of a specific proximal distance transcription factors and transplant that mesenchyme. And that's what we see here in the dark staining over here, okay? So maze one is a specific for the stylopode. So first section, the more proximal one. Hoxa 11, as we saw it before, is the pseudopode, right? So the middle portion. And Hox 13 is the autopode. So in here, what we have is mesenchyme from the earliest limb bud at stage 18. This is what we have in here. Will form all the three different types of the limb, right? Maze expression into the stylopode, Hoxa 13, this uh, darker bands is what in, in indicates. Then we'll have the two, so this is the pseudopode, and Hox A13 in the autopode or end. If we add, uh, uh, is incubated in FGF8 and WNT3A, the autopod transcription factor HOX13 is greatly expressed. And the stylopode makes maze one is drastically reduced. So here we see that we don't see that same induction, right? That we see in here. So this suggests that a balance between the proximalizing of the bone by the retinoic acid from the flank and the distalizing of the bone with the use of the FGFs and WNTs needs to be maintained for a certain period of time for the proper lymph formation and allowing the expression of the different Hox genes. <coughs> so it's not only whether retinoic acid is found in the anterior and the proximal or the FGF in the distal, but also the time that each of these cells will spend in those regions. Okay, so now is this anterior-posterior axis, how the cells get specified in this. So in chicks, once again, this anterior-posterior axis is established shortly before the limb bud is recognizable. So just very early during development. Although the differentiation of the proximal distal axis is thought to depend on how many cellular divisions are, are occurring uh, while the cells are in this zone of the progress zone that we mentioned before, okay? Information instructing a cell as to its position, I am proximal or am I distal, okay, comes from other sources. It's not only this zone of posteriorizing action activity over here. So the anterior posterior axis uh, is a small block of this mesodermal tissue, as we see over here, and that's the zone of polarizing activity. If this zone is transplanted into the anterior position of another, this is what we see over here, and another limb bud, we have, once again, 
a mirror effect. So we have also a chimera just because this zone of polarizing activity will induce, once again, the formation of the distal part, at least in this case, so the digits. So the polarity has been maintained, but the information is coming now from two distinct zones in the anterior portion and in the posterior portion. Now, the molecule conferring the polarizing activity of the zone of polarizing activity is of our very good friend, Sonny Hedgehog. Okay. So, honey hedgehog protein is always expressed in this zone of polarizing activity, independently of which limb we're talking about. So, all of this is that zone of Sony hedgehog expression. Okay. So, Sony hedgehog gene appears to be activated by the FGF proteins from the apical ectodermal ridge. So not only we need the maintenance of the FGF there, but also they are important for the expression of Sony hedgehog and to give that anterior-posterior uh, specification to these cells. So also there are two transcription factors that exist in the posterior region of the limb bud that are not expressed in the anterior portion, and this is HOXB8 and D hand. So this one's here. Okay. These two factors enable or may enable, because we don't know yet, this uh, science always evolves. So tomorrow we're gonna learn something else. Or so, oh yes, but not quite, something like that. Okay, but so far our knowledge says that. These two factors, HOXB8 and D hand, uh, may enable only the posterior mesoderm cells to express Sonny's hedgehog, as these two proteins appear to be restricted Sonny hedgehog to uh, posterior to the edge of the limb bud. What we see now in this image is the ectopic expression of a sunny hedgehog in the anterior limb that will cause the formation of extra digits as we see in here. So here in A, we have the wild type <coughs> of mouse. And here in B, we have the mutant for sunny hedgehog. And then we have here extra digits, okay? Because we have the double expression. Here in C, we have the wild type Sonic Hedgehog limb enhancer in the posterior part of each limb bud. So here and here, okay? And here in D, we have the mutant for both anterior and posterior regions of each of the mouse limb bud. So we have way more expression over here. In E, we have a human mutation for a sunny hedgehog that causes the mirror image hand duplication. And we see that also in other mammals like this cat, and this is what we call the polydactylus, poly, multiple, so polydactylus, they have multiple fingers, also happen in kittens. Okay, so let's see how this sonic hedgehog completes the specification of the autopod portion. So sonic hedgehog is what gives that specific identity to the digits. And this specification of the digits is primarily depends on the amount of time sonic hedgehog genes is expressed, so it's like a wave, okay? And only a little bit of the concentration of sunny hex protein that other cells receive. So the amount of time that sunny hedgehog is expressed and a little bit on the concentration, 
that those cells are exposed to. And so in here we have the A, we have the early mouse in limb, and then we have here the section of Sonny Hedgehog expression. Okay. And we see the progenitor of digit four, which is in the green color and the progenitor of digit five, which is the red dot in here. And both of them are found in the zone of proliferating activity, is a PA, which expresses the sunny hedgehog. Okay, that is the light green. So as it continues growing, that is a later stage, as we see in here, it's longer, right? The cells forming the fifth digit are still in the zone of proliferating activity, but the cells forming digit two are no longer in that zone. So we just specify <coughs> digit four in this section. In C, what we have is when the digits form, the cells in digit five, as we see here, <coughs> have had seen graded expression of sonic hash hub because they remain longer into the zone of polarizing activity. Okay. But the cells forming um, the digit uh, four, they were less time in there. Here in D, what we have is an schematic of digit four or five that are specified by the amount of time they were exposed to sunny hedgehog in an autocrine uh, fashion. Digit three, as we see here, is specified by the amount of time the cells were exposed to sunny hedgehog, both on an autocrine but also on a paracrine fashion. Digit two in here is specified by the concentration of sonic hedgehog itself received by paracrine diffusion. Okay, so from here to there, how much sonic hedgehog was diffused. And then digit one is specified independently of sunny hedgehog, and this is why it doesn't have any color in here. So no sunny hedgehog determines digit one. Okay. So we see here that sunny hedgehog acts as a morphogen because it diffuses from the zone of polarizing activity to make the determination of digit two, but not digit one. Okay, but also determine each digit from the posterior pinky towards the anterior thumb, depending on the amount and the concentration. So autocrine or paracrine. Okay, so it acts as the three different elements that we have seen for cell determination, right? Paracrine, autocrine, and also as a morphogen with a gradient. Is this clear how the digits are specified? Okay. So, Sony Hedgehog in the zone of polarizing uh, activity initiates and sustains a gradient of BMP proteins. And this protein specifies also the digits. So digit identity is not specified directly on each digit primordium, rather the identity of each digit is determined by the interdigital mesoderm between the digits. So this one here in red, okay? So they have a position anterior posterior, but now the real identity will depend on this mesocarp over here. Okay, so that interdigit membrane. So the identity of each digit is specified by the webbing between the digits. Okay, this is the region of mesenchyme, while 
that will undergo apoptosis in order to free each of the fingers of the digits. The interdigital tissue specifies the identity of the digit forming anteriorly. I want to repeat that again. The interdigital tissue specifies the identity of the digit forming anterior to it. So towards the thumb or towards the big toe. Okay. So in this figure, we see how by removing the interdigital mesoderm between digit two and three, so this is two and this is three, it would remove that mesenchyme in there. The second digit was changed into a copy of the first digit. Okay, so it becomes a little shorter. This is the wild type. This is how it should look, right? And here we see that it's not as long, right? It's shorter. Similarly, uh, when the interdigital membrane between digit three and four, so this one here, is removed, the third digit also changed as a copy of the second. So it's not the longer. Now it becomes shorter. Okay. So that final identity is given by the webbing in between the digits. So in this figure, we see a little bit more of that specification again. So at the beginning of the limb formation, when the limb bud is small, an initial positive feedback loop is established between the FGF10, as we see over here, that is becoming from the mesenchyme of the lateral plate mesoderm. This first activity normally goes to activate WNT3, okay? When WNT3 is activated, then at the same time, it activates the beta catenin pathway, okay, which induces the synthesis of the FGF8. So FGF10 induces the activity of WNT3. WNT3 activates the beta catenin pathway for the generation of FGF8. And this is where the apical ectodermal ridge will be formed, okay? Now, FGF8, as we saw before, activates or maintains the activity of the FGF10 in a positive feedback, okay? So as lean grows, this zone of polarizing activity that is where the sunny hash hug we saw um, is maintained, creates another regulatory loop, okay? And this is what we see here in V, okay? So sunny hash hug from here in the posterior mesenchyme creates this new signaling center, as we see over here that induces the posterior to anterior polarity and activates this one orange in here that is gremlin and is gremlin one. Gremlin one prevents the mesenchyme BMP, as we see in here, from blocking the synthesis of FGF8 in the apical ectodermal bridge. Okay, so Sonic Hedgehog becomes the second center of induction to maintain Gremlin 1, and Gremlin 1 impedes BMP to maintain the expression of FGF8 in the bridge. Okay, FGF8, as we see over here, also regulates two types of proteins, the ETV45. This one is a repressor of Sony Hedgehog transcription, okay? So, but this is along this anterior-posterior axis and reinforces 
the sonic hedgehog. So it's in, in, inhibiting sonic hedgehog to be expressed in the anterior, but keeping up in the posterior section. Now we have the generation of this dorsal ventral axis. So the third axis to be is either we form knuckles and nails and claws, or we generate the ventral portion, which normally would be the palm of the soles of the limb. So this dorsal ventral polarity of the, the limb bud is determined by the ectoderm encasing it. Okay, so this is our ectoderm over here. This is the dorsal and this is the ventral, these are the bones, and this is the foot pad that we see here. Okay. So different experiments have been made uh, that have shown that if the ectoderm is rotated 180 degrees with respect to the limb but mesenchyme, the dorsal ventral axis is partially reversed. So the distal elements, the digits are upside down. Okay, as we see in here. So in here, we're gonna have foot pads in both sections because we have rotated it. One factor that seems really important for this is the WNT7A, uh, which is the molecule the most important to specify this dorsal ventral axis. As we see in this figure, this is the dorsal portion of the limb. This is the ventral portion. This is our zone of polarizing activity in this section. And here is our ridge, okay? We see that WNTA, 7A gene, is expressed in the dorsal, but not in the ventral ectoderm of the limb bud. WNT7A later induces the activation of another gene that is the LMX1B. I don't know why they need to put, and somebody commented on that at one point. They are so, to put some, so many names to these things that it's so hard to, to keep those straight, okay? Anyways, so this is the limb one, okay? For sure, the gene is the LMX1B, that is limb one. Uh, normally, this is only expressed in the dorsal portion of the limb bud, okay? This gene is specified the dorsal fate, uh, the cell fate of the limb. If we delete this WNT7A, we're going to have a mice that have both, this is what we have here, the pads, foot pads on both ends of the leg. doesn't have them into the... Uh, one. So I'm just looking at it is 11, uh, 17. So, and we still need to go through a couple more slides, but we're going to finish that on Thursday. Okay, just trying to get this off my. Okay, so we want to finish the couple of the slides that are, we have left. We want to watch one video uh, that sums up a little bit this, and then we're going to continue with our next chapter that is the endoderm. Okay. Do you have any questions for today? Yes, Dr. Martinez, I just wanted to confirm does digit five refer to Binky? Yes. Sweet, thank you. Any more questions? I was wondering if you know, um, my uncle has this, the webbing. Do you know why it stays? Is there like a malformation or like for a reason? It oh, that's, that's the next slide <laughs> in the section. The apoptosis of the webbing and what happened if some uh, is, is not induced. So hopefully I'm gonna answer your question on Thursday, Anali. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, guys, so if there is nothing else, I'm going to continue trying to finish the feedback for the outline and start marking the uh, assignment. Okay, have a very proactive week, all of you. See you on Thursday. Professor, uh, yes, I sir. have a question. Regarding yes, the hair. outline, I wasn't able to, uh, to send the outline because I received it uh, on Friday. When do you receive on Friday? Uh, the paper term outline. Do you mean the outline of the term paper, right? Yes. I received it on the same day that you asked us to uh, write the outline. Well, the the guideline for the paper has been posted on D2L since the 26th of February, Maher. Yeah, but actually, uh, the, the notification and the paper, I wasn't able to see that. I don't know. But I, I, I don't know what happened in there because it is it's being posted since, and I have mentioned it a couple of times already in lecture, is posted on D2L since the 26th of, of February. Yeah, I have something. There is something wrong. I wasn't able to see it. Uh, from the day of the post, and it was it only showed uh, on Friday. I don't know what okay. is wrong here. Well, as I say, this uh, online is just to help you guys to to start with uh, the search. It means that you have lost about three weeks now, right? So, but uh, you should have told me before. Because I, I say, as I say, it's being posted. I mentioned it uh, before. Is 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 there? Is in the Dropbox. Just start doing your research. So as, as, as soon as you have the time to, um, yeah, Brian, I, I know, but everybody else have submitted. So it seems that it's only the two of you that have had this issue because I have mentioned it in class and many many times. And when I posted it, I told you guys in lecture, say I posted it, so you should start your research as soon. So when you get the chance to start looking at uh, all the indications that I gave, I provided a couple of uh, videos. I also provided uh, some uh, resources, papers, and submit the outline. And I will be able to, to comment, but uh, anyways. There is nothing that I can do. I, I posted it, and so far I have received the outline of almost everybody. Anyway, I started my research, but mm -hmm. uh, as I said, I, I wasn't able to write the outline, but I already started looking at uh, some articles uh -huh. regarding the microplastics and the hormone and um, uh, disruptors. So Yeah, so... Start looking at it. If you want to send me your outline, I, I will be happy to look at it and give you some feedback as I have been doing since last week with the rest. Okay. Okay, I'm going to do uh, it this week. Yeah, that's okay. And as I say, I mean, this, this doesn't have any marks. It's just for me to be able to uh, guide a little bit your work, right? No, but this and, is going to be very important for me because it's going to give me some guidance whether I'm I'm right or wrong uh -huh. in my research. Yeah, and that's what I always uh, offer to, to send me the outline so I can guide you a little bit on, on that. And okay. I, I really don't know why you and Brian didn't show that because I mentioned it since the 26th. I mentioned that I have posted it and, uh, and it's there. I haven't changed anything. Yeah, I, I, I...